So, uh, hello everyone and uh, bonjour and welcome to this webinar organized by our center, the Center of Human Rights Research and Education Center and uh, with the Canadian Red Cross. We are happy to have our two guests today to talk about a topical and very important subject. It's a subject related to the war in Ukraine. So as you, you know, uh, uh, the armed uh, conflict of the war in Ukraine enters a second year. And with the prospect of enduring for several more, what rules of international law govern the conduct of hostilities? As importantly, how effective are these rules in practice? So despite the deep historical roots of international humanitarian law, each succeeding generation must interpret and apply the law in the means and method of warfare advance and develop over time. So please, I would like to invite you to join me and to join us to welcome our guest. First of all, the first guest is our friend and the, the, the director, actual director of uh, the Canadian Red Cross, uh, Maître Sophie Rondeau. She's so, as I said, uh, a director and legal advisor at the Canadian Red Cross in the International Humanitarian Law Team. She started with the Red Cross in 2005 as a humanitarian issues program coordinator for Quebec. She then held various legal and governance function in the organization. Sophie Rondeau graduated from the University of Montreal, from the University of Quebec, and also she uh, holds a PhD diploma from the University, uh, University de Genève and University, University Laval. She's a member of the Quebec Bar, and in the last 15 years, she has been a researcher, guest speaker, and lecturer in various Canadian university, and she worked in institutions such as rights, uh, right and democracy, and John Pictet competition. So uh, I'm not reading all her CV. So this is a short information about our first guest, Sophie Rondeau. Our main guest, our colleague, and our uh, visiting scholar, uh, Mr. Brian Cox. Uh, uh, whom I would like to say thank you, thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting our invitation. We are happy to have you on board today. So uh, uh, Brian uh, uh, Cox is a doctoral candidate lecturer at Cornell School and visiting scholar at the military uh, at the, the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. He retired in 2018 from the US Army after 22 years of military service as an airborne infantry soldier, combat camera operator, airborne infantry officer, and judge advocate. So he, he's the best uh, person to talk about uh, the conduct of hostilities in Ukraine with this uh, large experience. Uh, his combat deployment include Iraq and Afghanistan as an operational law advisor and then the chief of international and operational law for regional command east. His military awards, decoration and qualification include, I'm not telling, saying them all, but I, I, I gonna mention some of them. Some, some of his decoration and qualification include the Ranger Tab, Senior Parachutist Badge, the Pathfinder Badge, Aerosol Badge, and so on. Professor Cox holds an LLM from Queen's Law Faculty and a bachelor degree in international relation and the GD from the University of North Carolina. So we, as you can see, we have, uh, we are too lucky to, to, have, them, to have him uh, today to talk about this issue, the war in Ukraine and uh, mainly about the conduct of hostilities in Ukraine. Before giving, uh, ceding the siege to, 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 to Sophie and Brian, I would like to add that uh, this uh, uh, webinar uh, is organized, as I said, by our center and the Canadian Red Cross. And it's, the, the event is to launch the registration period for our summer school in international humanitarian law 2023. Ce que je Aujourd'hui, cette conférence intéressante qui va être prononcée par notre collègue Brian Cox et par notre ami de, de la Croix-Rouge canadienne, Sophie Rondeau, s'inscrit dans, dans un événement qui veut lancer les inscriptions pour notre école d'été en droit international humanitaire 
qui va avoir eu lieu euh, cet été, donc l'été 2023. J'encourage, euh, je vous encourage à s'inscrire et à diffuser l'information. Je tiens également, avant de céder la parole à les, mes collègues, de souligner, de remercier Madame Sophia Carreau qui va euh, assurer l'interprétation instantanée de cet événement. Donc, il y a une interprétation et vous pouvez choisir la langue en cliquant sur le bouton euh, dans le chat. Je remercie tout le monde. Je remercie les membres du centre, Viviana Fernandez et Caroline Fauché, qui, euh, qui assurent les, les aspects logistiques de cet événement. Donc, sans plus tarder, going to uh, talk to uh, let you with our guests so Sophie you can say a few words uh, before uh, sitting uh, the, uh, the stage to uh, to our uh, guest uh, Brian Cox so thank you very much thank you very much uh, Jabbar good afternoon everyone this is a real pleasure to be uh, speaking to you this afternoon I'm joining you from Winter Wonderland. I'm in the unceded territories of the Montagnais, the Etchemin, and the Algonquin people in the Charlevoix region in Quebec, and I'm very happy to be here uh, with you. As it was mentioned earlier by Jabbar, this webinar launches the opening of our registration period for the 15th edition of our summer school, which is taking place May 20th to June 22nd. So if you're interested in learning more about IHL, this is just to whet your appetite. This webinar, you have an occasion to actually engage for a full week, and we hope we can see you either in the French cohort or the English cohort. We're the only bilingual IHL summer school in the world, so I hope you take advantage of this uh, possibility. You'll also notice that our speaker prepared his remark loosely around the work plan that we have for the summer school. So an IHL overview, protection of civilian population, and then rights and obligation of combatants, conduct of hostilities, means and methods of warfare, and finally, implementation and accountability mechanisms. Uh, I'll be moderating this session and act as your voice as participant, uh, making this what we hope will be an interactive session. Since you're not able to ask your question directly to Mr. Cox, I'll be checking the Q&A function and redirecting uh, the question to our speaker as we go along. En vous rappelant que nous avons en effet la traduction simultanée en français et en anglais, et j'ajoute ma voix à celle de Jabber pour euh, remercier Sophia Carrero de nous permettre de faire cette traduction simultanée, je vous invite à poser vos questions dans la section questions-réponses en français ou en anglais. Il me fera plaisir de les traduire pour les communiquer à notre présentateur. In addition to the question you may have from the audience, I may also add my grain of salt when the timing is right. Sometime I'll be playing uh, Advocacy Day by putting forward maybe a more humanitarian interpretation of IHL. And at other times, I might be digging deeper into more technical or more theoretical questions. One thing is for sure, I'll remain very flexible to make sure this session is as dynamic as possible. I now have the pleasure to leave the floor to our guest speaker, Mr. Brian L. Cox, and I'll ask him a straightforward, although quite complex question to kick things off. Brian, how can we utilize the rules of international law, or what we sometimes call LOAC, governing the conduct of hostilities to limit as much as possible human suffering that is caused by the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine? What are your thoughts on this, Brian? Hi, Sophie. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Center and to the Faculty of Law for hosting this event, as well as the Canadian Red Cross. And um, Sophie, a special thanks to you, uh, to guide, my dear friend, for guiding uh, this discussion today. Um, right. So the, um, the, one of the main purposes of, of um, LOAD, Law of Armed Conflict, or IHL, International Humanitarian Law, is to limit the effects of, of or limit the effects of armed, armed conflict. Um, and so that that you know extends not only to combatants but also to the civilian population. And so uh, that's kind of at one of the the cores of uh, of the this body of law. Uh, and uh, as we'll see, um, it's you know kind of it's designed to strike a balance between uh, humanity and military necessity, right? And so in, in some ways, limiting the effects of military necessity uh, in order or the the impact of military necessity uh, for the benefit of the civilian population and for the victims of war. Um, all right, so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen.
go back to the beginning here. Great. All right. So as you can see, uh, this is the the title uh, of the uh, the discussion. Uh, we will be focused on the conduct of of hostilities in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Um, you can see here there's an outline of uh, some of the topics that I'm, uh, I've prepared um, to discuss. But we may, if, if we don't make it all the way through uh, the um, the outline, that's that's totally fine. Uh, there's enough here um, to last uh, for the hour, or indeed for an entire uh, IHL summer course, right? And so, um, you know, we, we can uh, tailor the, the discussion uh, as we need. Uh, but this is a general overview of kind of the, the main topics that I uh, plan to, uh, at least some prepared, uh, prepared remarks uh, to address if we do make it through it, that's great. Um, and as uh, Sophie mentioned, um, I, I developed the outline kind of loosely based on the, the program for the upcoming IHL summer school. Uh, the timing actually worked out fantastically great on this. this um, the, you know, this is the day that, that registration opens uh, for the summer school, and it wasn't really planned that way. It just kind of worked out for everybody's schedule. And so really fortuitous that, um, that the event, today's event, uh, also uh, corresponds with uh, the opening of registration. And so these are the, 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 the type of topics that we'll um, engage with here uh, during the webinar will be the types of things that you'll see uh, if you attend, of course, the, uh, the summer school. Um, all right, so one of the main uh, kind of ongoing themes that's really going to kind of pervade uh, the discussion uh, today is, is, this, is this idea of perspective. Um, and so it's, it's helpful. I'm not going to obviously go through uh, my, you know, uh, my background necessarily in detail, but it's helpful, I think, to at least have a sense of where uh, where my perspective uh, comes from. And so um, I kind of see that I really have kind of three separate careers so far. Um, and the first career over there on the, the far left is, is an operational uh, combat soldier that spent 15 years um, you know, engaged in various occupations in the U.S. military. Um, and that formed my perspective or my approach um, to uh, my second Kind of broad career, um, which is a military legal advisor. And so the advice that I gave and the training that I provided uh, to soldiers and commanders and staff and decision makers was largely informed by that 15 years of operational experience uh, that I developed prior to becoming a judge advocate. And now that I've, as you can see there, the bottom picture is when I retired from uh, the military in 2018. That was at Fort Drum. Uh, my wife is there. She is uh, currently a a, um, a legal advisor for the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, and so she was there for the retirement with our kids who are three and who were at the time were three and one. Um, and so you know, that was the, the end of my second career as a military legal advisor. And now that has formed my perspective uh, as I've um, transitioned into my third kind of career, I guess you could say, uh, as um, an academic and professor. And perspective is important. Uh, I think it's, it's, it should be the, the starting point for uh, many of the discussions uh, that we have because uh, involving law of armed conflict or IHL, um, because uh, as I've noticed while I was in the military and I didn't really kind of uh, understand why it is or the effect that it is, but very often it seems that there's kind of two separate discussions uh, that happen. Um, and although there is some, uh, some cross collaboration, which is very useful and very welcome, uh, it doesn't always happen that way, right? So the military was kind of, you know, very often, especially with decision makers um, and advisors are, you know, they, they are having discussions for, you know, kind of an internal audience for, you know, making decisions or, or providing training within the military. And for and this is a um, a statement of uh, from the Lieber Code of 1861 uh, that uh, Francis Lieber described in Article 14 of what his his idea of military necessity is, and you can see there that the the green aspect is fairly permissive, right? So this idea that combatants or those who are, are engaged in hostilities are there to secure the ends of the conflict, whatever it is that they were sent into the conflict for. Uh, but the, the red, the lawful, uh, the under, underlined in red there, the, the law um, can be thought of as a constraint, right? So it's not completely unlimited. Um, the law is, is kind of a, a constraint on what can be done in the name of military necessity, right? So that's more of kind of a combatant's approach. Um, and I've got here an uh, example of the ICRC, uh, their, the definition of the purpose of IHL, 
as you can see, that's uh, that's primarily designed from this perspective to limit the effects of armed conflict. And so, although we, you know, we everyone, both uh, communities, if you want to just kind of you know generally say broad communities, both communities uh, understand that that this is a uh, that law of armed conflict exists on a balance. We're trying to balance military necessity uh, and uh, considerations for humanity. But the the way you know, the background and the purpose that you apply LOAC will uh, very often uh, kind of inform how you approach this balance. Uh, and so, you know, my my approach tends to be uh, more, you know, from a, a combatant perspective or a practical perspective. And it's important for those in the military to recognize that that's not the only perspective. And it's also important for uh, for those that, that practice primarily on the humanitarian perspective to recognize that, you know, humanity or uh, considerations for humanity uh, are also not the, the the only consideration. It is a balance. Uh, and, you know, how we think about and conceptualize that balance is largely uh, a reflection of, of our background and our purpose for applying LOAC. So just a bit of background on what we uh, will and will not uh, engage with today. So um, you can think of the law involving armed conflict, kind of a broad umbrella uh, term um, as kind of the, the two, the, 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 at the very top, there's kind of a bifurcation. One aspect of that law uh, is use ad bellum or the law involving when uh, a state or other actor can resort to force. And then the other uh, body of law use in bellow now that the, the uh, conflict has begun, uh, what rules uh, govern the conduct of hostilities, right? So our focus today is going to be primarily, almost exclusively, on uh, the latter use in bellow, which would be the Geneva Convention's additional protocols and customary law involving the con uh, conduct of hostilities, uh, almost the complete exclusion of the former, which is uh, ad bellum, the, the law involving the right to uh, recourse to force. Um, Brian, Brian yes. before you move on so, to those two streams of Geneva and Hague law, kind of that overview, uh, IHL. So this total separation between what would be use contra bellum, so the law mm. prohibiting to wage the war, and use in bellow, so IHL or LOAC, this has several consequences. It's often difficult for public opinion to understand and for those fighting to defend their country to accept that kind of total separation. So could you clarify for us or, or provide a little bit of comment. I know it's a big question, but do Russia and Ukraine in the current conflict have exactly the same obligation under IHL? That, you know, that's a, a fantastic question and a fantastic uh, point of discussion, right? And so if um, and there is, there has long been, and there continues to be, uh, you know, a fairly prevalent perspective that we should not bifurcate. Right. So if if so, if a leader of a country, let's say, you know, President Vladimir Putin decides to engage in an aggressive war uh, that, that constitutes a violation of ad bellum, um, you know, so that's one area of responsibility. But he can't, in this case, uh, President Putin can't engage in that conflict unless he's got troops that follow his orders. Right. And so the thought is, well, if, you know, uh, sure, you know, the, the, the civilian leadership, whoever it is, bears responsibility for engaging in an aggressive war, but uh, should not the soldiers who are also engaging in an aggressive war share responsibility for that? And it's a valid point. Um, so my perspective on that is that if we value civilian control of the military, then we must have that bifurcation. If we don't want militaries, you know, in the U.S., say the Secretary of Defense, to decide on, in this case, his own uh, se uh, uh, Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin. If we don't want Secretary Austin to decide on his own wh whether he's going to go invade a country, then we need to have uh, you know that bifurcation so that responsibility for the decision to go to war is separate from the responsibility for those who are actually fighting the war. Uh, and so, in response to the question about uh, the obligations, you know, are they the same? Uh, there's certainly a bifurc. Uh, there's certainly a separation in the obligation uh, on the ad bellum side, right? So, uh, Ukraine is the victim of aggression. Um, you know, they, uh, and so they don't. They they have the the right of of uh, self defense, inherent right of self defense, pursuant to international law. Uh, and so that is certainly different. But once the, the conflict has begun, those who are engaged in hostilities, they all have the same obligation, right? And so, uh, and that is, that's reflected in, uh, in Bello. The, Thank you, the, Brian. The yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think that concept of equality of belligerent, which is something that maybe we thought was a little bit theoretical and was kind of a given, 
during conflict is is very important in terms of the the public opinion so thank you very much for this clarification and i'll let absolutely. you move on with your your other point but thank you absolutely and, and it does uh, just before we move on uh, just briefly it does make sense like there is some inherent um you know reasonableness to this idea that that everyone shouldn't be you know should have responsibility for the ad bellum decision to to go to war um, so that, although it's reasonable i think the the consensus is and certainly i share uh, in this if i if i'm correct in describing it as a consensus uh, that there is a bifurcation involving the decision to go to war between the leadership who decided to go to war and those who are uh, engaged in the hostilities and the, those who engage the, are engaged in hostilities have equal uh, obligations uh, to themselves and to you know to the the area where they're fighting um right brian this is a, yes. a flexible we do have a, Q, a question i think it's okay. going to link up to all of the elements but let me uh, put that forward and it's also looking at the amnesties and accountability so let's see how we work with that the question is working with the ukrainian white uh, ukrainian war crime team one fear they have is any peace deal will have an amnesty for Russian war crimes. Is that yeah. something that could happen? I, I think it is. Um, and I, I think there's there's something that, um, and I plan to, to address enforcement uh, near the end if we do make it that far, I'm not sure that we will. Um, but uh, the, the, so there's, there's a sense uh, when it comes to enforcement about trying to, to determine exactly you know, what the purpose of the law is, right? So if it's to, if the purpose of the law is to guide hostilities while the hostilities are ongoing, um, then you know, uh, that, that's, that, that can be the focus rather than um, the, the um, you know, another purpose would be after the conflict is over, um, you know, how do we go about, um, you know, enforcing it against the, the folks who may have uh, violated uh, the law? And there's, some, there's always some tension there. There will be some tension there because we, you know, the, the Westphalian, um, you know, model of of uh, nation states has been adopted as kind of the unit of measure, um, you know, for the the international community. And so, if, unless we're going to, um, you know, uh, invite this idea of piercing sovereignty to go put our our physical hands on on people who uh, are alleged to have violated the law of war in in Ukraine, and now they're back in Russia. Um, there's going to be challenges with with uh, achieving um, in person uh, jurisdiction in personum uh, jurisdiction uh, over those uh, those personnel. Um, that said, you know if if there is no uh, actual enforcement after the fact, then it can be really challenging just to think of this and describe this body of the law as law, right? And so if there if it's thought that there will be amnesty afterwards, then that can discourage uh, the you know the the actual recognition of of the law and application of the law uh, while the, the hostilities are ongoing um and it there's just it's going to be a political decision i think you know what's going to be more important if um if this idea of of um of uh pursuing justice pursuing accountability is going to be an impediment to uh ceasing the armed conflict um uh, it's going to be you know it's going to come down to a political decision on how how to, to go about handling that. Um, but certainly very challenging discussions ahead uh, on that front. Um, all right, so uh, on the actual law of armed conflict uh, itself, uh, it's, we can be, it can be thought of as being just divided. Um, so you know, we've got the law involving armed conflict and then down here, ad bellum and in bello. If we stick to in bello, we can think of it as uh, of in bello, the conduct of hostilities being further divided into two general streams, the, the Geneva stream, and the Hague stream, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those because uh, I will address Geneva first and then Hague uh, in our uh, our comments or our remarks today. Uh, so uh, the, the the tendency starting in probably you know post World War II certainly um, has been to uh, to converge uh, these uh, these these streams or what were thought of really as separate bodies of law into uh, you know the text same uh, the same texts. Uh, but it's very helpful to, to maintain uh, the uh, conceptual uh, divergence of the two. And so we can think of, I'm, I'm drawing here from uh, Necessity and International Law uh, from uh, Jens Aline and Larry May, a book that was published, I think, 2013, if I remember correctly. Uh, they describe this idea of necessity uh, as a cluster concept. And so necessity can be thought of in different ways. Um, 
in if we are applying law of armed conflict in you know as combatants or other fighters who are fighting against each other in the armed conflict necessity in this uh, this case operates as a license um, to allow certain uh, certain activity in this case in support of uh, the ends the uh, the political ends of the war um, you know in support of that ultimate goal and once a fighter can be shown to be you know I, I'm a fighter low act applies to me now necessity applies as a license but whereas another application of necessity can be thought of as necessity as an exception and this is what generally what we're used to if I'm walking down the street say or down the sidewalk uh, I and I see somebody that I don't like, I'm not allowed to uh, to physically assault that person unless an exception applies, right? So necessity as an exception. So if that person is attacking me, now I've got the right of self-defense uh, as an example for an exception. And so on the Geneva stream or the, the, the protection for the victims of armed conflict, uh, there's a sense that you shouldn't use physical violence or physical force unless an exception applies. Right. And so that's kind of that's how necessity applies in the, the Geneva stream. And we'll talk first about Geneva and then about Hague. Uh, and so while I did mention that, uh, that the tendency is starting. All right. So 1966, an article written by uh, Jean Pictet. Uh, and then uh, this book that I show here in the center it was 1973, if I remember correctly. Uh, he's it was one of the pioneers that described, you know, let's merge these bodies of law, Hague and Geneva, and also human rights into the umbrella of IHL and look for uh, these uh, these areas that where the three bodies of law uh, kind of converge and you know, their, their similarities rather than their differences. And so it makes sense to, to, to kind of uh, think about them together for you know, shared purposes. Certainly the additional protocols of the Geneva Conventions of so 1977 for the additional protocols or the Rome Statute 1998. Uh, you know, there, that's for convenience, if nothing else, the tendency is to convert, converge Hague and Geneva law into the same treaty, um, you know, because it's, they all involve the law of armed conflict, law of war, conduct of hostilities, uh, but it is very helpful to maintain the conceptual uh, and uh, conceptual separation when we're analyzing and applying uh, the law of war. All right, so uh, starting with the Geneva stream, uh, just a really brief overview of the historical foundations. Um, you know, the, the, I, th this isn't this is fairly fundamental and fairly basic for those who are have a deep familiarity with uh, application of law of armed conflict, but recognize that not everyone does. Uh, it's helpful to at least have kind of an overview of, of the historical foundations of each stream where they come from. And so the the Geneva stream really began uh, with the the second. War of Italian uh, Independence. This would have been uh, 1858 uh, or so, if I remember, remember correctly. Uh, Henri Dunant uh, uh, was was a, basically a, um, a bystander. Um, he just happened to see, find himself at one of the decisive battles of this, uh, this armed conflict, and he wrote. Uh, see, the GC was developed in 1864. So in 1862, he would have published uh, a memory of Solferino. For those who haven't read a memory of Solferino, uh, I I strongly encourage you to to read it. It's it's available uh, on uh, the ICRC website and probably a lot of other places. Fairly short read, um, but uh, in this case. In, and so I'm going to try my best to, to pronounce his name uh, properly. So coming from, uh, I'm from a small town in Oklahoma, and then I lived for 15 years in North Carolina. Uh, and so I very often have a Southern accent. My kids um, try to you know, encourage me to not speak French because they say it hurts their ears. And so I, coming from, say, Oklahoma, North Carolina, I would, I would say this name is Henry Dunant. And I understand that that, that that kind of hurts the ears, certainly of my kids. They say, please don't do that. So um, I'll try my best for, uh, and Sophie, you can kind of evaluate my pronunciation. So um, Henri Dunant, um, if I can give it a shot here. Yeah. That was very good, Brian. Brian. Uh, if I can Thanks. take a minute to uh, yeah. command your control of French, very good. And also asking you to slow down because we're doing the translation. So our translator Perfect. tried to, to slow down, but Henri Dunant was uh, very good. And just to add uh, um, to what you were saying, like the movement of the Red Cross was indeed born out of the battlefield. So uh, Solferino mm -hmm. was the bloodiest battle in Europe soil since the Battle of, of, of Waterloo. So that kind of triggered not only uh, the existence of what we now know is the RCRC, but also the first Geneva Convention and kind of the mobilization, uh, it, it kind of went viral before its time, like the, that humanitarian 
Center right. movement was uh, was uh, was very uh, keen. And I, I'm going to take one second to make maybe a uh, almost like a, a publicity for our movement. Last February, it marked the 160th anniversary of the work of the Red Cross to bring relief yeah. to millions of people. So even uh, since, I mean, there's a lot of technology technological advantages that have changed warfare, but the suffering of the civilian, they remain the same. So if we're looking at the body of IHL that you are mentioning, but also the work of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Movement, it follows uh, that kind of fil d'arrière, the kind of red line that we can, uh, we, we, can, we can follow. So thank you for uh, linking it up, the story of uh, uh, Solferino together with uh, uh, Absolutely. Henri Duna. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And if you read, uh, so the reason I encourage folks, if you haven't re already to, to read uh, Solferino, uh, it's a fairly you know, brief read, but it really shows the, um, the, the roots of the Geneva stream, right? So um, Dunant, through his advocacy and philanthropy, um, he went on to encourage states to develop the first uh, widely ratified treaty uh, involving the law of armed conflict in human history, which is uh, the 1864 Geneva Convention. Um, and you can see in the 1864 convention, uh, the roots that, that were developed by Dunant in Solferino. And so one of, if I can draw on one of his main points, the main threads that, that run uh, throughout the um, the, um, the of Solferino is that it, this would be so adopting these humanitarian principles, adopting these humanitarian rules before an armed conflict starts would be beneficial, extraordinarily beneficial for those who are engaging in armed conflict. Because if we agree beforehand on what the rules are uh, for those who are, uh, are wounded and sick and no longer able to fight due to sickness, Ill illness, uh, injury, or detention. Um, then, you know, if, if I send, if I'm a combatant and I send my forces into this armed conflict, it's more likely that they will want to fight um, in this armed conflict. And so, um, you know, because they know that they'll be uh, treated humanely um, and respected if they do end up getting captured. And so it's, you know, it's, um, Dunant, even though it is, a, you know, humanitarian protection perspective, he is really appealing to uh, the interests of those uh, states that he's, he's encouraging to uh, to ratify the 1864 GC. Uh, so the Geneva Convention, uh, for the initial one was ratified in 1864. Uh, it was fought, it was expanded upon, so it focused primarily on wounded and sick in the field. 1906 GC did the same thing, ex expanded on 1864. 1929 Geneva Convention uh, applied primarily uh, to prisoners, uh, addressed primarily prisoners of war. And so this is our historical foundation that leads us uh, to the four Geneva Conventions, the, the foundational conventions that we have now of 1949. So GC, oh, sorry, that's right, I'm just slow down a bit. Um, so GC1 uh, is uh, the Geneva Convention regarding the wounded and sick in the field. Uh, GC2 is the same, but applying it to uh, the sea. And so wounded shipwrecked, uh, uh, um, wounded, sick and shipwrecked at sea, uh, which expands um, uh, Hague 10 of, of 1907 and brings it into the Geneva Conventions. Uh, so that's GC2. GC3 uh, involves uh, prisoners of war, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, so GPW. And then GC4, as far as I'm aware, uh, doesn't have a widely recognized um, uh, abbreviation like GWS or something like that. So it's just GC4, uh, but it involves civilians in occupied territory, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And so, although it is fairly common uh, to think of the Geneva Conventions as the law of armed conflict, that's not actually accurate, right? So the Geneva Conventions are universally ratified. The 1949 Conventions are universally ratified, but each one has a specific area of coverage. Uh, and so, you know, they are a part of a major, a central part of the law of armed conflict, but the law of armed conflict and um, and Geneva Conventions are not synonymous, right? So it's helpful to keep that distinction in mind. Um, all right, so that's some of the historical background. So let's, uh, and if we think of uh, going back to necessity as a cluster concept, uh, certainly for GC1, 2, and 3, uh, so those, those contexts, wounded and sick uh, uh, in the field, wounded and sick shipwrecked at sea, and then uh, prisoners of war, Necessity functions as an exception here. The, the idea is you should not, you have to use force against those personnel that are covered by the first three GCs unless an exception applies, right? So necessity as an exception. So let's take a look at how a, a couple of topics that are certainly in, uh, in the news involving 
uh, the conduct of hostilities uh, specifically for uh, the Geneva Conventions, right? And so, uh, and we'll start with GC3, a couple of topics involving prisoners of war. Uh, so I'm, I'm showing my American here. So it's POWs that we typically use the um, abbreviation. I understand that my Canadian colleagues typically refer to this as PWs, so leaving out the O. Um, so treatment of PWs or prisoners of war, POWs. Um, so one of the, the main kind of controversies in public discourse right now in the, the conflict in Ukraine is, uh, is whether Ukrainian soldiers who uh, take photographs of Russian POWs uh, and then display those, those photographs uh, in, in you know, kind of in public discourse for various reasons, whether that constitutes a violation of Article 13 of GC3, uh, the prohibition against uh, subjecting prisoners of war um, to various things, including public curiosity. Um, I've seen various, uh, uh, various takes and various opinions on this. Um, so the, the ICRC position that has emerged is kind of an extension of the, um, the interpretation of public curiosity that was developed in the, the uh, 2016 commentary. Um, so this updates the, the initial commentary that was published by Pictet. Uh, in the 50s. And so 2016 um, commentary kind of ad, ad, um, advances uh, and expands upon the original Pictet commentary. And in the 2016 commentary, uh, the, the ICRC takes the uh, kind of expands upon what it means to, to subject a POW to public curiosity, kind of defining that term. Uh, so the challenge with this, though, is that is certainly a, a reasonable interpretation, but I'm not sure that there's enough uh, um, uh, state practice to establish that that definition applies uh, kind of across the board as the controlling definition for what it means uh, to subject P PWs to uh, uh, public curiosity. And so I've seen reasonable uh, opinions differ on whether the, the now that we can certainly, we can start with, with, with the position, this is public curiosity, right? So that the conduct that, they, that the drafters of the, G, the GC3 had in mind in 1949 is, you know, the conduct of taking prisoners of war, parading them to the streets, um, you know, uh, and uh, making a mockery, basically, uh, of these uh, prisoners of war, right? And so there's no military necessity in doing this. Uh, and so, you know, necessity at, uh, functioning as an exception. We shouldn't do something like this, uh, subject them to public curiosity, unless an exception applies, and this is not really a valid exception, right? So that's the, the conduct that, that the, the drafters of um, and ratifiers of uh, the GC3 in 1949, uh, or 40s, and then um, um, entered into force in 1949, had in mind at the time. And you know, it's it's safe to say that there's no controlling definition for what it means to subject someone to a curi uh, to public curiosity. Um, the the commentary that developed in 2016 is certainly reasonable. Um, uh, I I commend uh, for a further discussion on this. I commend uh, an article that was written by uh, Eric Jensen and Sean Watts uh, last year on articles of war, where they they uh, go into this. Um, but, you know, the law, the commentary, and their take uh, kind of in detail. And I tend to agree with, with Eric and Sean uh, on this, that because we don't have sufficient public uh, uh, state practice to, um, to really define what it means to, be, to, to subject a PW to public curiosity, uh, I'm not sure that we can say that, depending on the context anyways, I'm not sure that we can say that that the, the, what uh, the Ukrainian soldiers have been doing um, with the photos of Russian uh, soldiers by itself, um, just you know, uh, sending those out to the public in order for, you know, to notify uh, family members, say, for example, of, uh, of who has been taken captive, as, as an example, that doesn't necessarily uh, um, constitute public curiosity, but uh, reasonable arguments can be made to the contrary, for sure. Um, if I can... If I can add, ahead, Brian, so, to uh, yeah. to this one also, uh, one humanitarian approach uh, to this one would be to say that you do have impartial uh, uh, humanitarian bodies taking care of that. So the movement yeah. of the Red Cross, the RCRC already has sure. mechanism that do family verification, a central tracing agency, which is an institute that has been mobilized because we have an international armed conflict. So as you mentioned, you have the four Geneva Convention. So there are other ways where public curiosity, even if it's not as clearly defined as, as you mentioned, and we might be in a gray area, you have other means that will right. definitely protect the humanitarian aspect of those people deprived of their liberty and not necessarily expose them to a situation which may amount to public curiosity or may not. So mobilizing those other body would be uh, aligned with the obligation under IHL, but also, uh, also. Uh, let me just 
stop you here and thank you for slowing down a little bit for our interpreter. That's very much appreciated. There are some people that are asking questions, but I'm navigating between the chat and the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So please ask them the uh, Q&A, please. Uh, let me just, uh, so we have uh, two questions and you'll see which one you wanna, you wanna address first. Haven't Russian soldiers done the same to Ukrainian POW? So kind of coming back to uh, equality of belligerent, and maybe if you want to comment yeah. on that. And another question, which is a, a, a bit broader than just POW, but links up to the comments that you made. At what point of the so-called uh, uh, military operation uh, by the Russian did it became a war? So maybe coming back to the qualification of conflict and international armed conflict and triggering the application of IHL. So if you want to tackle those two questions. I also want to acknowledge there is a comment on the first question on amnesty that has been shared in the Q&A. So I'll probably bring it back and share that for the whole group uh, more toward the end when we might be looking at accountability mechanism. But for now, you have kind of that military operation coming into a war and also treatment of POW Russian versus Ukrainian. Right. Um, and I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Uh, my battery died on my headset. Can you hear me okay, Sophie? Still? I'm all yeah. good. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so the, the first point is well taken. You know, have, haven't uh, Russian soldiers been doing the same thing to Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian soldiers? Um, so I think the, the first uh, comment that I have there is, um, is this is why, um, you know, assessing compliance depends so much on context. You know, uh, so I would want to know what it is that Ukrainian forces uh, intend to do, how they're going about doing it, uh, whether this constitutes public curiosity. And I would want to know the same thing uh, for for the Russian forces. Um, and then this, the second aspect, and, and Sophie, you, uh, you've brought this up uh, a couple of times, and I think it's a really important topic to to keep in mind is the you know the equality of of combatants or equality of belligerents, right? And so this I one one aspect of that is this idea that you know my my adversary may be violating law of armed conflict uh, but that's an issue for you know for the adversary and the adversary can be held accountable either internally uh, through their own forces or if they're captured later and subjected to some sort of uh, enforcement mechanism uh, externally whereas you know I, I still have my obligations uh, that i need to comply with right and so um I think I'm going to, in the interest of, uh, I would love to, I, I could actually spend the entire hour or more just talking about ad bellum. Um, you know, so at what point it is that the special military operation um, has, has transitioned into a war, um, if at all. Um, and I, I, you know, I think reasonable perspectives can differ on this as well. Um, I, I'm gonna actually withhold my perspective on that because I know it's, it's incredibly unpopular. And I don't have like I don't want to I don't want us to, to get sidetracked too much on ad bellum, um, you know, so that we can focus on conduct of hostilities. But um, the, the short answer to that is, um, you know, the I think the, the consensus view is that this has been a war since the very beginning. Um, it's not necessarily my view, but this certainly the consensus view. Now, there this there's absolutely if we want to look at the, um, you know, the legal terminology, this is absolutely an international armed conflict a conflict between two or more states rather than a non-international armed arm conflict, which would be you know, a conflict between, for example, a state and a non-state armed group or two or more non-state armed groups, right? So that's a non-international armed conflict. There is without a doubt, this is an international armed conflict and it has been since certainly February 24th when Russian forces um, you know, crossed into Ukraine. And some could argue, I think reasonably that this backs up even further uh, than that. Um, but uh, I'm going to withhold my own uh, personal perspective on that, because uh, if I uh, express mine, then I would have to probably spend the rest of my time uh, and then some um, uh, supporting that view. And so I want to if we if we can focus. Thank you for that, Brian. There's one question on, on time, and I think it's going to uh, just link up with that. So, uh, one question, is, is it at the beginning of 2014 or 2022? And I know occupation will be a subject yeah. that you'll tackle a bit later on. I think that's where this is going with 2014 yeah. with the occupation of Crimea, but I, I wanted to flag it to you since it was asked in the, in the Q&A. Yeah. So when you move on to occupation, you might be able to answer that question, I think. That's right. Yeah, and th there's no doubt that this conflict, whatever it is, has been going on since 2014. 
um, you know, at the um, at the beginning when, when Russian forces uh, invaded Crimea, uh, and then you know, it kind of uh, flared up in, in eastern Ukraine in 2015, and it's it's been going on ever since. There's no doubt about that. Um, the full scale, you know, the the large scale combat operation um, really began, of course, in uh, last year, almost a year ago um, today. Um, all right, so I'm going to actually just kind of uh, briefly touch on murder uh, because. This is a, a perfect example of, of what the, you know, the third Geneva Convention or the Geneva Stream is really all about. So you can see um, a media report there at the bottom of you know, reporting that this is what it was found, uh, Russian soldiers are found to, uh, to have done uh, in Ukraine. And this is an ex uh, absolute violation. Um, this, is, this is why the Geneva Stream exists, right? There's no necessity to, do, uh, uh, to engage in that, um, you know, that conduct. Um, once a soldier is out of the fight due to sickness, illness, injury, uh, or capture, uh, right? So if we go over to, uh, to Article 13 of GC3, uh, uh, this would be described as, uh, as a serious breach. And so that actually reminds me, um, I was going to, uh, just to kind of take a mental break, I know we've been going for, at it for, uh, going at the discussion for a little while, so just kind of, you know, disengaging for a moment, uh, a, a joke actually occurred to me today, uh, so I'm going to share it with you, um, and it really kind of ties into to our discussion, so the joke is, that, that occurred to me today, is uh, what do you call an area near the ocean where no jokes are allowed, right, so the answer to that question, uh, in case you're wondering, is a serious beach, right? Serious beach. That's not to be uh, confused with uh, our next topic here, serious breach, right? Uh, if my kids were here, they would say dad joke, um, right? And so which it kind of is, I guess. All right, so a serious breach uh, of the, the Geneva Convention. So all four, GC1, 2, 3, and 4, near the end have uh, almost identical, if not identical, provisions involving repression of breaches, right? And so this is an example of a serious breach, certainly of a war crime, um, of, you know, a serious breach of the Geneva stream and of law of armed conflict. And it would, you know, qualify as, as a war crime. Um, all right. So um, in the interest of time, I do want to get to Hague. Um, so that's the next slide. And I also want to reserve, I know we've been addressing questions as we go along, but I want to reserve uh, some time near the end where I stop speaking. We just address questions. So um, just briefly for civilians in occupied territory, I think of of necessity here in GC4 as kind of a bridge between exception and constraint, right? Because it's kind of a bridge between the law of armed conflict and human rights law. This GC4, the provisions of, um, of GC4 civilians in occupied territory, it's designed to apply in a situation where human rights law is, you know, is not able to apply because a government, government is not in place and you know a hostile force has taken over um, uh, taken over territory, but that hostile force is not a governing force, right? And so I see, I think of GC four really as as a bridge between uh, exception and constraint. We think of military uh, or think of necessity as a cluster concept, and so this is an example of of some uh, alleged conduct of Russian forces. Uh, in relation to the uh, the occupied um, civilians in occupied territory, um, uh, territory that Russian forces have occupied. And all of these would be a violation of GC4, absolutely. Um, uh, almost all, uh, just kind of scanning over again, almost all would be grave breaches, would be uh, described as grave breaches. Um, and uh, Tony uh, Blinken, uh, in this case, the US Secretary of State, described these as uh, as crimes against humanity. So this idea that it's not just a war crime against an individual person or individual group. This is widespread and systemic enough that it qualifies as a breach against all of humankind, right? So that's where this idea of crime, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against humanity um, comes from. And so uh, uh, Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, is suggesting that, that all of this conduct uh, kind of put together based on the widespread and systemic um, um, nature of, um, of the conduct constitutes crimes against humanity, um, which I tend to agree with that, uh, that characterization. What you will not see on here is anything involving the Hague stream, which we'll talk about next, really just for a couple of minutes, because I do want to um, save some, reserve some time at the end uh, for questions and discussion. So this is all 
uh, necessity functioning as either an exception, right? So if the GC one, two, and three are applying, or as a kind of a bridge between uh, ex exception and constraint, if we're looking at GC four for civilians in occupied territory. Now, if we switch over to the Hague stream, I'm going to kind of, you can see here some of the, um, the um, historical antecedents um, or the, you know, the foundations um, for the Hague stream, but I'm going to uh, kind of breeze through the, the discussion of that, right? So we were, what we were talking about before um, the, you know, the Geneva stream, uh, necessity functions primarily as an exception, um, sometimes maybe as a constraint, depending on, on how your perspective on GC4, uh, but here we're talking about the combatants or other fighters who are actively engaged in hostilities against one another, right? So in this case, necessity would function as a license. And so that's conceptually um, uh, distinct from uh, the Geneva stream. Um, all right, Sophie, uh, do you mind if I just spend, say, three minutes uh, on Hague stream so we have something to talk about during discussion, and then I'll stop there and kind of open it up? Of course, and also bring it back. I like I like the um, the analysis that you did around occupied territories and crime against humanity, and we can navigate that. This is a complex and a highly political sphere. Uh, usually, you know, violation of IHL will be crimes of war. That's how it works. But you do have to come into play political actors, the international criminal court. So thank you for kind of uh, identifying and pointing to different uh, elements that uh, are very complex when you're, you're you're navigating it. I think uh, opening that door was uh, super interesting, and it's definitely something that we we may not have a, a specific answer to it, but it's kind of giving us an overview of the complexity of the armed conflict itself, even beyond the humanitarian cost that we we can see. So yes, you can go ahead, and we'll we'll okay. navigate. Uh, the different element and we'll save a little a uh, little bit of time at the end to kind of come back on some of the questions that were asked so go ahead yeah absolutely and I, I feel comfortable with that as well because we have been addressing questions as we go along rather than you know saving everything at the end so I want to have at least something to talk about during uh, Q&A uh, and discussion uh, on involving the Hague stream so we can kind of compare those two um, so the Hague stream uh, you know is our provisions if you look at additional protocol one which is really a fantastic reference in a law of armed conflict um, or the, the Rome statute uh, of 1998, really, again, um, a fabulous uh, textual uh, or conventional reference. Um, you can kind of bifurcate, you know, you can see th these are the offenses that would occur against someone who's out of the fight due to sickness, illness, or injury. Um, and so that would be kind of a Geneva stream. And then the Hague stream would involve uh, conduct that, you know, say targeting, right? So I'm trying to achieve the, I need to use force to achieve the ends of, um, uh, you know, the political ends that, that sent me into this armed conflict to begin with as the combatant. Uh, one uh, really uh, uh, significant topic of discussion right now is, uh, is the potential use of cluster munitions. Uh, and I like uh, actually that how this, this Forbes uh, contributor, um, you know, kind of a, approaches this idea of, of using cluster munitions as a, um, as a deadly dilemma, right? So cluster munitions are incredibly effective on the battlefield. As you can see, kind of see what they are there, they're, they're, they're able to, uh, to attack, um, you know, forces over a wide area, uh, but all those, not all those bomblets uh, explode on contact. Uh, and so they're, they're incredibly effective at destroying uh, enemy personnel and equipment, but they're also incredibly effective at destroying civilian persons and property after the, the armed conflict, right? And so because they are incredibly effective, there's this, this idea of military necessity that we should be using these. And, you know, every Russian soldier or Russian tank or Russian piece of equipment that we take off the battlefield using a cluster, say a cluster bomb, because those are highly effective, is one less Russian soldier who is still alive or in the fight to attack our civilians, right? And so there's this balance here. Um, and you have to balance that against, well, look at all the bomblets that are gonna be left over after the conflict. And it is, it really is a deadly dilemma. Um, Ukraine is not uh, a, par a party to the Oslo Convention involving cluster munitions. So there is no uh, international, uh, international law reason why they would not use cluster munitions. Uh, I, I, I hear, Cluster munitions very often described as internationally banned weapons. Um, just to clarify, um, it's kind of a play on words there. There is an international ban, 
for those, those countries who have signed up to the Oslo Convention. It is an international convention for those countries it is banned, but as a matter of custom, uh, there is no, like for, for countries that have not signed up to the, um, the Oslo Convention involving cluster munitions, there is no international ban uh, for those. Landmines is a bit of a different story uh, because uh, Ukraine is party to the, uh, the Ottawa Convention. Um, and, you know, again, there's this tension, the same tension that there is with cluster munitions. Um, landmines are highly effective um, at, um, you know, at destroying enemy personnel and equipment, but they are also highly effective at destroying civilian persons and property after the armed conflict. Uh, but the difference here is that Ukraine has ratified the, the, um, the Ottawa Convention, and so any use by, uh, by Ukraine of landmines would be a violation of that, uh, that convention. And then the last thing I'll, I'll talk about, and we'll skip the, the last, the, the plenary topics um, that I was planning to talk about there at the end. So if you just, so we can uh, talk about, this is a huge um, topic uh, on, you know, on a lot of people's minds is attack on, attacks on civilian infrastructure, right? So you can see there, um, you know, there's, it's a, a heavy, heavily um, covered media story for good reason. Um, and uh, again, various perspectives differ on this. And, and uh, this takes us back to this idea of approach or perspective, right? So this is an incredibly um, constraining view of the application of, um, of the Hague stream um, in the context of, of attacking civilian targets. So this is the US ambassador to the o OSCE who made the claim that these attacks are with no military purpose whatsoever. Um, I think that may be more, um, more of kind of a, uh, a political statement, political characterization, rather than an actual um, statement of how the law applies. Um, so one, uh, one fairly reasonable, I should say incredibly reasonable um, perspective on this, uh, I would uh, um, commend folks who haven't seen these, this pair of articles written by Mike Schmidt on Articles of War. So the first one he wrote in, in October of 2022, and about a, month about a month later, he had a follow-up. And his perspective is, you know, he goes through a, a very rigorous legal analysis uh, in uh, applying international law. And his, uh, his outcome on that is that these attacks do constitute violations of the law of armed conflict. Um, so he's kind of in the middle ground. Um, my perspective tends to align more closely with my friend, uh, Charlie Dunlap, uh, who has a blog called Lawfire. Uh, so I encourage uh, any folks who are interested in this topic to, uh, to find this article. And, and, uh, and Charlie's point, or uh, General Dunlap's point on this is, um, you know, he refers to a separate article written by Jeff Korn and Sean Watts uh, on Articles of War, making the point, which I also endorse, listen, if we're talking about uh, accountability, we need to require, we, that accountability and assessing compliance uh, requires us to understand the judgment of the attack, what judgment went into the attack and not the outcome of the attack. Um, and that's, you know, this, again, where you fall out, where you come down on this, uh, this discussion really, in a lot of ways, is informed by your perspective and your approach and how you address, uh, how you conceptualize the balance between military necessity and humanity. Uh, with apologies, uh, Sophie, I know that leaves us just three minutes if we're going to end right at one o'clock. Uh, and so I will skip um, the, the discussion of the, the plenary topics. And I'll just go ahead and close my portion of the, of the presentation uh, by saying, you know, of course, I welcome discussion and questions. If we run out of time here, uh, there's my, uh, my organiza primary organizational uh, email in case anyone in the audience is interested in reaching out on anything that we've talked about here. If we don't get a chance to address your questions um, during the Q&A. With that, I'll stop sharing my slide and uh, sharing my screen, and I hope, and then I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brian. That was quite a tour de force. You can try on your French if you want to uh, go with that. Uh, yeah. The example with the civilian infrastructure, but also the cluster munition, I think, uh, uh, speaks volume about the of the parties to the conflict, here being Ukraine and Russia, which are parties to the Geneva Convention, like all other states at the UN, but are also not party to the Oslo Convention that you mentioned that, tag, that talks about cluster munition and also uh, the nuclear weapon uh, treaty. They're not both parties, but they still need to comply with general treaty and customary law. And that includes the principle that we mentioned, distinction, proportionality, right. and precaution. So kind of bring it back from a legalistic perspective, but also a more uh, 
um, uh, I would say, uh, common sense uh, angle. Yeah. So thank you very much for shedding light on this. I'm going to look at uh, the different input that we got on, uh, on, on, on the chat for the one minute left. And I'm going to uh, circle back and kind of close the loop on the first question where we talked about amnesty, if it was something that could happen. And one of the participants in the audience say, well, not sure what could happen mean. It could mean could an amnesty be negotiated and agreed as a matter of fact, yes, it could. But if the question intended is to ask, would it be permissible in law for there to be an amnesty granted for the commission, the commission of international crimes? I believe the answer should be no, that even such agreement, if negotiated and agreed, would not enjoy lawful authority and should not be recognized before law abiding institution or ad adjudication. Uh, is it contended otherwise? What are the sources of law? So I think this is a good way to kind of wrap things up and kind of talk about universal jurisdiction, accountability for the most atrocious act. And uh, we might go over uh, two or three minutes. So I, I think the participants were going to stay on, but I'm going to leave uh, the last word for you on kind of that uh, wrapped up uh, question and thank everybody for their, uh, their invaluable input in the chat in the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you. And that's that's also, um, you know, bring, bring it back to this idea of amnesty, right? So enforcement, what is the law for? Um, what is the purpose of the law? And if it can't be enforced, is it actually appropriate to uh, to describe it as law to begin with? Because that's what that's what's supposed to separate law from, you know, a good idea uh, or, ma or values or morals or, or you know, whatever. Um, I absolutely agree that um, if the we may see an agreement on amnesty between the parties, right? So I, you know, I'm going to paraphrase what I could see as a potential provision in a peace agreement, you know? So the parties agree that we will not uh, pursue, you know, criminal prosecution for uh, any you know, of our adversaries that are in our uh, custody and control, and that we will release them uh, to uh, the, you know, the belligerent uh, power now that the conflict is over, right? And then we will not pursue, um, um, you know, prosecution ourselves in Ukraine or in Russia. I can see that something like that occurring. That agreement, uh, however, would be, you know, valid between Ukraine and Russia, or whoever else, you know, signs on to this agreement, it wouldn't be binding on, let's say, for example, so a couple of countries that come to mind, who have recently exercised what this idea of universal jurisdiction would be France or Germany, right? Uh, and so if, if a Russian soldier who's accused of, of, you know, committing war crimes in Ukraine, traveled to France, for an example, um, that, um, you know, that agreement that occurred between the part, the belligerent parties would not preclude France, as an example, from exercising its own jurisdiction to apply, you know, to, to prosecute crime, international crimes, right? So genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, those primarily those three in this context uh, for the conduct of hostilities. It also would not necessarily preclude, pr preclude the International Criminal Court from exercising jurisdiction as another example, right? So if there were an indictment that were notwithstanding the agreement of the parties, if the ICC were to publish an indictment uh, against a person who's alleged, who allegedly committed war crimes and that person traveled to the, the, the territory of a state party, that state party would, you know, would not be precluded from the agreement that occurred regarding amnesty from sending that person to um, the, the Hague um, to be tried at the ICC. Um, so th the, the short answer, I, I think, to, to really close this out is um, th there may be an amnesty uh, as part of, you know, of an agreement, a peace agreement in order to say, let's, th these are the terms that will allow us, each side, to stop fighting one another. And that agreement will be binding on those parties, but it will be binding on those parties alone. Thank you very much, Brian. As you were answering this complex question with a uh, good uh, conciseness, a lot of input came from the chat, and I think it's it speaks volume about having more question than answer at this point. It was raised the question of actual real life, the threat of nuclear weapon, uh, comparing it to other intervention of the West in, in Yemen and other conflict like in Syria, in Afghanistan, and also the question of NATO enlargement. So I could see the audience was very mobilized. I'm sorry that uh, due to time 
time constraint, we cannot dive into those questions. But at the same time, this launches uh, our regist registration period for our summer school. And having a whole week is a good opportunity to unpack those issues. And uh, as I said, enter into a discussion and seeing where we are. A year ago was very different than today. What remains the same is the obligation of state party under IHL and alleviate uh, human suffering wherever it is found, even in the worst situation, as we can see right now in, in armed conflict. So on that, uh, since we've extended our welcome, our virtual welcome online for five minutes, uh, Brian, I want to kindly thank you for, for being present, for engaging in that, that tough discussion discussion. I think uh, uh, we will be doing that more often, especially you being a, a, a guest at the center, which is a, a, for the, the summer school. I thank everybody for attending this uh, lunchtime webinar. Sofia Carrero, who undertook the mammoth task of providing simultaneous translation. Having discussion on IHL, both in French and in English, is something we take a lot of pride at the Canadian Red Cross and the University of Ottawa. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. I wish you a good, a good day. And I hope to see you at the summer school at University of Ottawa on the last week of May. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.